It is. This one is a Hungarian one. This one is a French. Hungarian, of course. Magyar. Thank you. We have been able to attract a fantastic group of participants with diverse background coming from all over the globe. I believe it's 26 countries and six continents. And you represent governments, oil companies, universities, international NGOs, and national and local civil society, allowing you not only to learn new skills, but I think even more importantly, actually, to exchange experiences among yourselves and learn from each other and most importantly, and this is what the School of Public Policy School often stands for, is to find out about what works in this particular field and what doesn't. That's our mission, that's our vision, that's what we want to teach our students. The School of Public Policy has been extremely fortunate to work with two fantastic partners, uh, the Revenue Watch Institute and the National Resource Charter. It was a real pleasure to work with you. You put together a fantastic program. And last and most importantly, I have the great pleasure and privilege to welcome our host tonight. George Soros is founder and honorary chairman of the Board of Trustees of Central European University. George has always been a great champion and since many years been an advocate and supporter of the cause to fight against this challenge, to deal with the resource curse. And I think there is no individual in this world, may I say, that has spent more efforts and more time to deal with this challenge. The whole thing really started in 2002 when one of the grantees of my foundation, Global Witness, came up with the idea of um, holding mining and oil companies responsible for disclosing the payments they are making to the governments so the governments could be held accountable, civil society could hold them accountable for how they are spending their money. We found a catchy phrase for this, publish what you pay. We gathered a lot of support, but when I looked at it closely, it really couldn't work. It was a fallacy, because you could prevail on the large oil companies because they are subject to public pressure. But there are many fly-by-night operations that you couldn't get to cooperate, and there are many national oil companies over which you have no influence. But the amusing and instructive part is that the concept itself was flawed it remains flawed. I don't think that I've been involved in any other endeavor that has produced as much as this effort. Let me ask you a very simple question just to get started. What's the oil price today? 114 for Brent. If we look at the West, what's the market there? West Texas Intermediate. West Texas Intermediate, thank you. And what's the oil price on that marker at the moment? Uh, 15 dollars less. less than the Brent. 15 less. And uh, what was the oil price on the 15th of August in 1998? Nine dollars. Recall, what happened in August 1998? Russia went broke. They went bust, effectively. As a good analyst, and you, you if you're not today, tomorrow, you will be a good analyst. I'm a reasonably good analyst, and if between now and tomorrow somebody comes to you and says, we want to have a contract, and we want to get $50 out of this contract, tell us whether or not we should do it with a service contract, a, a tax royalty regime, or a uh, production sharing contract, and they come to you and say, which one should we use, your response is going to be, it doesn't matter. We're in it for the money, and that, and that if what you want is $50, is independent of the contractual structure, 
I can get you $50. What is different under these regimes, how the risks are borne between the contractor and the government with respect to changes and unanticipated changes in prices and cost. Is it my point? We have a lot of problems. Yeah. We have a lot of problems. But it's not really eye to eye. It's their own uh, very different process. Okay. It's possible to, you know, to calculate, to quantify that in a realistic way. What you can do is you can't quantify that in an absolute amount, but you can in a relative amount. I'm working in Liberia, and Liberia had this, made this kind of mistake, the Liberian government, like a lot of years ago, that they gave out a lot of license concessions yeah, to the yeah, licenses. Yeah. Nothing worked out because no one was using the concession, because what they forgot was to force them actually to, to stick to a certain timeline. Yeah. Do the exploration, mm. they find the petroleum, and then they sell it off. Uh, I guess a lot of these much smaller companies do this. They flip it take the value and they sell it on to someone else and the government may not even see what's going on. Usually the way you stop that is through capital gains taxation. We need to make sure that the, the, the resources that we're exporting to other countries, we're capturing as much of that value as possible. What we're on about on today is going through the mechanics of the cash flows from a mining project and how to, how to analyse that, how to know whether we're getting a good deal from this. But let's not forget that market transactions don't exist in a vacuum. Markets are created by governments and ordered by institutions. Which means one needs to think a bit about who makes those markets, who defines the rules of the game according to which market actors play. Most of the mining codes are deficient as far as transfer payments are concerned. And actually how to capture them is very tricky. This is where the cat and mouse game comes into play. When we're talking about corruption, when we're talking about resources, when we're talking about this stuff, we tend to picture this as a morality tale. There's the evil elites sort of siphoning off the money, uh, you know, building nests, literal nests, in Paris or in New York or in, or in London. And, and we tend to think of this in, as a dichotomy, the population suffering, etc. But part of the impact of, uh, of resource wealth is that it changes the mentalities, not just of the population, of the, the elites, but also of the population. It creates a certain culture of entitlement. It creates a certain, you just have to look at Venezuela and the Venezuelan sort of civil service. It creates certain expectations of benefiting from the, the oil mana, if you will. But most importantly, it is an experience shared not just by the decision makers, the elites, but also the opposition. In many, many, many oil and mining rich countries, the opposition <coughs> don't stand for a different approach to the political economy. They just want to be the ones on top. If I was Ugandan, if I would be Ghanaian, I would be cautiously optimistic. If I was Ugandan, I would be worried, also because you have much more than the Ghanaians. Is it in Bolivia? Or? Bolivia, Bolivia. Uh, it was mostly at the level of distribution policies, but you're saying that even at the regulatory yeah. level, there is an effort at uh, overhauling that. Yeah. Most times, we do produce these things and send them out to raw. Let's think a bit about um, who sets the rules of the game. I think a good idea, at least I thought, is, is to simply look at who are the ones that, that effectively dominate markets now and in the future. Who is going to consume most of the energy, not only molecules but also electrons in the future? It's certainly not going to be the OECD. For the future demand, they will be pretty much out of the picture. China effectively accounts for about 20 to 30 percent, depending on the projection, uh, for uh, demand increases alone until 2035. Again, it's a projection, it's not a prognosis. Um, and China and India together, that's about 50%. So that's what we're talking. First hunch on who calls the shots. The uh, biggest problem now is how to gain uh, China's cooperation. And I think it will probably only be solved if you 
change EITI, mm -hmm. which has actually, in my judgment, has largely reached its its objective and uh, could easily be sacrificed for the sake of another uh, structure where the Chinese would be involved in designing it. Because I don't think that we will be able to get them to accept uh, what they regard as a Western mm. colonial effort. They have to be involved in designing it, and then they might uh, participate.